So I'm, I'm, I'm billed to talk about ICT to improve and strengthen communities. Um, and I'm going to do that in three parts. First is tell you a bit about 2020 Communications Trust, and then talk about the broader issues of digital literacy, digital skills, and digital inclusion, and how that relates to communities. And then finally, um, give some, some insight into the way uh, 2020 sees um, this, this region, this part of the country. Um, but before I start about talking about 2020, I thought I'd just give you um, the reason why we think digital literacy and digital skills and inclusion is so important. And this is an extract from a presentation that I put around, put, a, put it together about two years ago. And I was just talking to Russell at lunchtime, and a lot of the things that we were talking about, how things are going to happen, we're, we're seeing them now, and the question is no longer whether they're going to happen, but when and how. And, and the, 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 the three things about the future is, firstly, it's global. So our children and we have connections and networks through all the various social media that are around the world. So the, the, everything is, is going global, and that gives us some challenges. Um, so as things go global, problems go global as well, and global leaders are, are needed to solve all these big problems I've got written up. Can you see those words or not? You can. So as you can see. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Right, okay. So we've got some big problems that the world's grappling with, which is like, what have I got there? Uh, climate change, religious conflict, financial instability, natural disasters, nuclear proliferation, all those big things that, that, that uh, can't be solved by any individual country. And so those global things need sorting out. But what, and what that means at the same time is that We've got a split between the big pictures we need to be solved on a global level and the small things, smaller things, but the more important things to people's everyday lives, which increasingly are no longer being done on a national basis, are being done on a local basis, a community basis. The second trend is that everything is digital. So information is going to be available anywhere in the world at any time, instantaneously, at zero cost, and increasingly in any language. So I was doing some work in an in a Eastern European country earlier on in the year. They're a very small country, Moldova. They don't have, they speak Romanian. They don't have any English language newspapers. So I just go to their Romanian language newspapers and download them and it translates it on the fly. So the idea that, and, and that's available if I were buying the newspaper in the, in the street, except I can now read it, which I wouldn't previously be able to. Um, and so industries are being transformed, turned around, and we heard earlier from Carolyn about how that is being transformed in um, the education sector. And so the economic and social map, uh, impact is that we're getting emergence of new business. I was here last year and there was some, one of the high school kids had earned enough money by writing a computer game to put himself through college. And, and so you can start a business without having to be in the individual places uh, that you would previously have to be, like Wellington or Auckland. Um, and the third thing is that we've got a shift from consumption to participation. So in the 21st century, we became people who consumed content through TV and then uh, through the internet. And what we're seeing now is the fact that people can create content, which is why UFB is so important, because you're not just about downloading stuff, you're about creating stuff and uploading it as well. Um, and so we've got the social media and the cloud services and location-based technology and um, mobile devices. But what this means is that there is one market accessible from anywhere. So you can build a Facebook in your garage in Gisborne just as easy as you could build it in Harvard. I mean, you probably wouldn't necessarily get a billion customers, but you could get 100,000 customers easily. Um, Kim.com had a million customers sign up on the first day of mega release, so, and he was operating out of New Zealand. So you can create massive markets very easily, which has huge implications for New Zealand, biggest implications since the container ships, first refrigerated container ships set sail 150, 130 years ago, 140 years ago. So it's a huge opportunity. So this presentation was done for New Zealand, but it's a huge opportunity, and it's a huge opportunity for Gisborne as well. I mean, because uh, what I say to people at a national level is New Zealand is the most 
desirable place to set up a, a knowledge business. And I'd have to say, um, Gisborne is one of the most desirable places in New Zealand to set up a knowledge business. And the idea about tech companies starting here, I think, is, is potentially very exciting. Because you can do it anywhere. So, a bit, down to, a bit about 2020. Um, we're, we're the biggest digital literacy um, organization in New Zealand. Um, and we've got about 15 years of experience, and we operate in 16 regions um, across, across the country. The, the size and shape of those regions op, uh, changes from time to time. And we work through partners, primarily Internet New Zealand, um, using ICT industry suppliers, and also um, uh, our majority of funding comes from, from government agencies. Our, our purpose is to support communities to realize their full potential in the digital world. So what can, what, what can communities achieve and what a support and assistance and encouragement do they need? And so we help community-led projects to develop clear pathways. So where is it you want to go? Build the skills to be able to do things and then achieve independence. So we're not, we, we, we like to build independence rather than dependence. We don't want, as soon as a, a community is ready to stand on its own two feet, we want to step back. So they can operate effectively in a totally digital society. Totally digital means that you do everything um, digital online. So um, as an example, um, Denmark uh, is from 2015, only go Denmark government from 2015 is only going to offer their services online. They're not going to offer the option to go into a government office, fill in a form and give it to the government, the government official. If you are, for whatever reason, excluded from operating online, you can go into a government office, but they won't serve you they'll sit down with you by a computer so that you can learn how to do, do transactions online. So that's when we're talking about a totally digital future. We are talking about a world in which most of the activities that you do that are sort of compliance-based, and we're already seeing it in, I mean, banks, banks make it blindingly obvious that they actually don't want you to go into their branches. They'd much rather they, you did it at home. And we're expecting more and more of that. So digital literacy becomes increasingly important. Our programs, some of them you may have heard of, some of you may not, Computers in Homes, which effectively works through low decile schools to put um, a computer into a family home so that the parents get enough digital skills to be able to at least understand some of what their children are saying when they come home from school. So because the, we know that in the education system, the connection between the family environment and the child is one of the strongest factors in terms of influencing educational achievement. So we need to make sure that the families have digital skills to be able to work, work and interact with their, their children. And increasingly, if you don't have a computer at home, then you're actually getting a substandard education because information's available online, because teachers set homework online, because teachers require, give you some things that you have to access when you get home. So Computers in Homes is a very important part of that. That's our major program. Um, service uh, provides computers in um, the homes of 1,500 families um, per annum at the moment, um, which is making a bit of a dent, but you'll come on la later to see how much more of a dent there is. Stepping up is the next stage, which is once you've got a computer and you've got some confidence, then you go to the next stage, which is, well, how do I do more? How do I, how do I manage my insecurity? How do I... Um, use Word, how do I use Excel, how do I, how do I use the technology that I've now opened the door to. And then the third one is Kiwi Skills, which is, we've actually got a, a, a stall down in the other display area, where effectively you get a certificate um, that says you are competent in the basics of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint are the main three. Um, and then the other things we do, we do ICT in schools, we, we produce a, a report every two years of the state of technology in the education in, in schools around New Zealand. Um, and interestingly, the way we used to do that is we used to send a, um, a paper form to each uh, principal and uh, they'd fill it in and they'd give it to other people. And this year, for the, and, and we did about 600 schools, which is like 25% of the New Zealand education. 
education sector. This year we're doing it online and so we're going to get a much fuller sample and then we're also going to publish the results so that people can, we used to publish the results in a book, we're now going to publish the results online as well. So that's coming up in the next month I think. Living Heritage, which is a website where children um, tell their stories, create resources and say this is, this is part of what I was saying earlier about creating. So they put information up on their schools, mostly primary schools we work with, and stories which actually help to um, continue the, 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 the social history. And community Wi-Fi, somebody mentioned Kangaroo Forest. Um, uh, oh, it was uh, Richard. Um, yeah, so, and Craig, I missed the, the, the opening. But we do that. We worked down in Dunedin. And what we've got is, uh, with a, putting a community Wi-Fi through the school there as well. So what we've got is a, a body of, starting to build a body of experience about how community Wi-Fi works. And the other point, which I'd forgotten about, but um, was just reminded that during the census in earlier this year, we actually set up, I think there was about 100 and... 110 or 120 community places where people could go and fill in their census form. So if they didn't, if they wanted to do the census online, didn't have a computer at home, they were able to go there and um, and be able to operate it. So those are some of the ways in which those are the programs that we use to try and help bring technology to the community. So let's have a think about why is digital literacy schools and inclusion important. Well. One point is, I think that Stephen Joyce hit the nail on the head, which says there's no point in spending one and a half billion dollars on putting ultra-fast fibre unless people are able to use it to improve their lives. And it's also very important that we don't let a digital divide stop talented young New Zealanders from being able to access this digital future. And um, so I think things like this Tech Expo are fantastic as a way of connecting with thousand students tomorrow are going to come through here. I mean, it's just... just uh, the way I see students is um, they're, they're just hungry for the ability to use information and technology. So um, I, don't think, I don't think the digital divide is something that kids are going to put up with for very much longer. I mean, they're almost saying, get out of the way, I'm going to use it anyway. So our job is to work out how to, um, how to make that easier for them and for their far now. Um, this was a big deal about two years ago, the UN declaration, which stopped short of making internet access a human right, but came fairly close to it and said, basically, there are some human rights that are increasingly only going to be available if you use the internet. So, although it's not a, pri a principal human right, it is a subsidiary one. Um, so, you won't, probably won't be able to, oh, this has moved. That's a shame. Well, imagine that those three are down here, are down here. So, the first, the first step is awareness of technology, and that's what we give people with computers in homes, which says, here is a computer, this is probably how to turn it on. And if, if you're, um, you know, if you're a, a, a grandmother looking after a child after school, which a number of our um, 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 graduates are, the, uh, the fact of taking a mouse, moving it around, and seeing something happen on a screen is actually a completely new experience. So there's some very basic stuff you have to do in computers in homes, how to use it, um, by the end of the 10-week course, they're able to send and, re and, and receive emails and produce a basic um, te a resume from a template, a CV. A lot, of our, a lot of our graduates are people wanting to go, go back into work, rejoin the workforce, kids are at school, that sort of picture. Um, so that's, in many ways, it's, we, we call that digital awareness. Is this a touch screen? Oh, God. <laughs> 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 they, we didn't have that. We, had, we, we still had blackboard, I think, when I was at school. Not even whiteboard. Um, the second area is what we call basic digital literacy, which is what we get with stepping up, which is taking that to the next stage. How can I, how do I do this? How do I work with um, 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 multiple file types? How do I start um, Excel? How do I start and draw, do a PowerPoint and so on? And then the next level, which is key, Kiwi skills, and we're calling digital competence. Um, and that's about how do I get the skills I need in order to use this in my work, whether it's photo editing or whether it's advanced spreadsheeting or so on. And then above that, that's, that's when we get into what's called digital expertise. And that, that's where the people that are coming to build the next generation of, of tech people um, to, to innovate and create. Um, and with NZQA, for some of you may know, are evaluating the ICT um, curriculum at the moment. Uh, curriculum? No, standards, sorry. Um, and so they're looking at um, 
they, they, start, they started to look at levels three to seven, and we said, well, actually, that's fine for people who want a career in the tech industry, but everybody needs a basic set of IT skills, which is levels one to three. So it's called IT as a tool, and broadly speaking, computers at home would be level one, stepping up would be level two, and Kiwi skills would be level three in the NCA. So we're hoping to get that alignment more embedded. So what we're saying, effectively, level three is when you leave school, is it? That's what used to be called fifth form, yeah? Yeah. Um, sorry, seventh form. Um, so what we're saying is that effectively by the time you leave school, as your NCEA qualifications say, you are co fully competent in these digital skills, which is something that the workforce of the future and also the, the population of the future is going to need. So let's have a quick look at the regional perspective. Um, and... We've been, since 2006, we've been telling anybody who wanted to listen that we're 100,000 families in New Zealand with school-aged children without, access, without a computer at home. And uh, increasingly, as time went by, um, people were talking to us and said, well, what's the situation? What's the situation? What's the situation? And uh, a household ICT survey use came out um, earlier this year. And basically, it said that number of 100,000 had gone down to 69,000 families. So there are now in New Zealand... 69,000 families with dependent children who don't have access to the internet now. So it's no longer, seven years ago, the important thing was whether you had a computer. Now the important thing is whether you have access to the internet. So 69,000 families that, have, that don't have access to the internet and have uh, dependent children. Um, it's a bit of stats about whether school-aged children and dependent children are the same measure. So that's why I say rough statistics at the top. There's also challenges when I come on to the next thing about the situation in Gisborne Hawke's Bay because different, different sources of data um, draw different boundaries about the place. But broadly speaking, in, in the census 2006, there were about 7,000 families in Gisborne Hawke's Bay with school-aged children that didn't have a computer. And that dump number has fallen over the six years to 5,000. So there's still a long way to go. And, and as, I, as we run the Computers in pro, uh, Homes program, ministers say, you know, when will this be done? And I say, well, it really depends on how much you want to fund it, but there's a long way to go yet. Um, and interestingly, so in the, this, those six years, we graduated about nearly 7,000 families so of the reduction from 100,000 to 69,000, um, we can claim credit for, for maybe a quarter of that number. So presumably the rest of that is people going out saying, I'm going to have a computer. And in this region, um, we've, we've graduated 1,800 families and the reduction has gone down by 2,000. Um, so either people in this part of the, the country are more fertile and produce more families, so there's more new families coming in that don't, uh, that, that don't have access, um, or there's something else going on there. But effectively, there's still, in this part of the, 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 region, the, the country, there's still 5,000 families that don't have access to the internet that have dependent children. So I guess we'll be going, going, going on for a while. So the other question is, why don't they have access to um, uh, the internet? And Statistics New Zealand very kindly asked, asked that question in, have asked that question, and the answer is here. So I'll just explain this table. Um, the first thing is they, they did ask the information in 2009, um, and these are the national numbers. So 53% of the people who didn't have access to a computer in 2006, 2000, sorry, didn't have access to the internet in 2009, it was because they weren't interested. So of those 5,000 families, half of them didn't think it was for them. Um, that's fallen, so it's fallen to 46%, so there's been a drop in terms of the people who says it's not for me. The second is because it's too expensive, and the, that factor's gone up. The other factor is I don't have the confidence or knowledge or skills, 14%. I can get access somewhere else, I can get it at work, or I can get it at the library, 6%. I'm concerned about the safety and security of my children, 1%. It's not available where I am. Interestingly, that's gone up, which is slightly um, counterintuitive. Another. And this doesn't add up to 100% because they can give more than one reason as to why they don't want access to the internet. Not a census-based survey, so I can't remember the sample size. So what they've given us instead 
is a low and high re rate, um, re percentage range for each of these variables. Um, so there's some interesting things in there. The first thing is that the, 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 the not interested range is between 1 and 48%, which means I'd say that the, the, med the average within Gisborne Hawkes Bay was, was less than the national average. So what that says is in this region, we've got m m more, we've got, we've got less people saying they're not interested than we have on a national basis. So we have here a community that is hungry to get connected. The second is the costs are too high, um, and that's much more than the national average. So we've got people who really want to get connected, but the costs are too high for them to get connected. That's particularly more, more accentuated here than anywhere else in New Zealand apart from Northland. Um, the third is that the lack of confidence, knowledge, and skills, which again is above the, where the national average is. So, so I want to get connected. It's too expensive. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. So this is the, the pattern of people in this region. The fourth is I can get access elsewhere. I mean, the range, the trouble is the range for these last four are so, so broad that you can't really um, draw too many conclusions at it, apart from the fact that there is a higher concern about safety and security, and probably there's a higher, higher percentage of not available as well. So that, if you like, gives us a, a, a pop... A, an idea about what the, the people in this region are when it comes to connection to the internet, their overall, their overall attitudes and perceptions. Um, and I guess what that tells me is this, that's a huge opportunity if we can unlock a couple of keys, one of which is, which is access, and so we can, uh, we can deal with the fact that not as many people, so we, if we had more access, library's doing a great work, Computer hubs are going to be doing a great work. Um, but the second is we need to think about something about doing the costs are too high as well. And um, so coming on to the costs are too high, I think it's just the, the, the costs of, I've got a comparison. Oh, the costs are too high is the biggest barrier. Um, point out that you get Sky Basic with sports and movies, and Sky Basic hasn't got much more than Freeview anymore, as far as I can tell, because most of the, 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 all the stuff on Sky is like um, uh, movies and sports and other premium channels. And you're talking about 100 bucks a month, which is more than a, um, uh, an internet connection. If we were listening, if anybody of you was in the last session where Ant was talking about, Ant Royal was talking about why he loves fiber and being doing a great great advertisement job, you get what you want when you want it, as opposed to the old model, which is Sky. You have to buy the whole bundle, even if you only want you know, a couple of programs, you've got to buy the whole bundle. So, um, so I'd suggest that actually it's not a question of cost, it's more a question of value. So uh, it might be interesting to see how many of those, those uh, where was the previous slide, wasn't it? How many of those 5,000 families that don't have a internet connection have a Sky um, connection and a Sky with movies and, and sport. Why are you spending 100 bucks on Sky when you can take the 100 bucks and you can probably get the equivalent in terms of um, entertainment and also a whole lot more for the same 100 bucks? And I'm not sure that we've managed to get that message across to people. That And, and there's pro probably also a lot of barriers to, to actually taking that up. I think that's about all I was going to say, and I was going to open it up for some questions and or discussions about anything I've said. How do I do for time? Yep. Anybody want to say anything? Comments, questions from the floor? And the All Blacks, yes. You can't get... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that place I was talking about where I was working in uh, Moldova, you can't get... I mean, I'm, I get so annoyed in countries where you can't get the All Blacks on the t local television. I mean, not, even on the local cable television, you can't get it, but they, you still can't access it online. There was a guy who was posting it like... Um, 
two days later. There was a guy who was live streaming it for a while, but he got shut down. Now there's a guy who's posting it two days later, but he's just been shut down as well. It's like the, the, it's like the, 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 the content providers haven't yet worked out that there is actually a global market out there. I mean, they just say, we're going to sell it here, we're going to sell it here, and if you're not there, then we don't, give it, we don't care about you. Um, Penny, perhaps a question for you um, in context of this is, what percentage have you seen using your um, internet-connected computers, local versus visitors? Um, it's mostly local, and the question I was going to ask here um, was, you had on your um, graph there that cost was a really big factor, a, a big barrier, yeah. and So what we used to do was we effectively funded half of the cost of one year of internet connection on computers in homes. And about a year ago, and the, the problem we had was exactly the one you're talking about, which is we got a drop off. Um, when we stopped, we, so we, we funded it by basically saying, we'll pay for it for six months and then you have to, you have to pay for it after that. And, and that increment of new expenditure in the household is not is not something that most of our families can actually absorb. So what we shifted to about a year ago was we'll pay half of the cost of your internet connection for a year. And we saw that the uptake went from about 30 to 35% of the families. 65% dropped off after our, our six months. 35% stayed there. And now we've got a retention rate of about 60%. 60 and the other thing we've discovered is most of the ISPs only sign you up on 12-month contracts with direct debits. And almost none of our families are happy about signing up for a 12-month contract with direct debits because you just know. Um, so we've basically, we now offer them the opportunity to pay by automatic payment instead. So they pay us. We, we still sign the contract and the direct debits come out of our account, but the families pay us. And they pay us, we started off saying pay on a monthly basis, but an awful lot of our families can't even budget on a monthly basis. So basically it's dependent on the, the, whether you've got a landline or not. It's either 5 or $10 a week. Um, which, and we're seeing families being able to, to accommodate that. So adjusting the family budget by a small amount in order to understand the value you can get and then sort of uh, that, that makes you in a position when you've had 12 months of usage to say, well, now we're going to have to find that, um, that we're, if it's a $5 a month payment, then they're going to have to put that up to 10. So they, they go up to $5 a month when they, when they graduate from the program, and then another year later, as long as they've been getting some value, they have to cover the full cost of that themselves. And that seems to be working as a model. We're, we're only one year into it, but, it, but it's recognizing that the budgeting systems and the payment systems that families run their households on doesn't match with the, the business model of the, 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 most of the ISPs. So you've got to try and get a balance between them. Yeah. Service online. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That was unfortunate, wasn't it? They cannot provide for an unemployment benefit by going into the On the machine.
part of my home, I would welcome them at cost of my estate and also my spent money in prison. Mm. And one particular case was a guy from Chile who was a, after the earthquake was inception on. He was so concerned with his family. He stayed in Lisbon five extra days so he could come and use the internet mm. Yeah, there's a question here. Um, one, of the, one of the things to me, and this might be more related to Russell being yeah. but particularly at the coast, you know, we know that these issues around um, affordability and access, which is on the improve. But to me, you know, every community up there has a school or a club, and, you know, possibly for, they probably use seven hours out of every day. Yeah. Um, so, Computers and homes is a good idea, but it's obviously not sustainable if yeah. people can't afford a computer yeah. or the internet access. We've already got a resource there, so it's about using that resource yeah. and putting, providing somebody who's going to enhance that digital literacy yeah. so people can get So there's a couple of... Um ways in which you can do that. The first, the first is to use the school's internet connection and put a Wi-Fi tower out of the school and then people who live in that community um, can access the Wi-Fi. Um, and that, there's two different models that have been done for that. The first of which is you get access to the same thing as you would have at school. So if in the net, when the network for learning comes along, Children can also have access to that, so they can, anything they can do at school, they can do at home, and it doesn't cost them anything because the Wi-Fi is already there. Um, the second option, and that's the uh, Point England Manakalani model, the second option is you use the, 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 the fiber that's in the school to provide effectively open access Wi-Fi. It wouldn't go anywhere near the school, it'd just give people access to the wider community, you'd have to, the wider internet. You'd have to do something about traffic costs in that potential, in that case. But that's again another, another model that um, a school, I'm sorry I can't remember off the top of my head, has done. So that's one option, so you're using the, the technology infrastructure. The other option is to um, open the computer labs, you know, for two hours before school and six hours after school till nine o'clock or ten o'clock. I, I, I know it's the library here that's doing that, isn't it? Um, I, I, the, the, there's a couple of problems with that. The first is it's illegal um, in terms of the Education Act, and the second of which is it's problematic in terms of um, facilities. You've got to have toilets, you've got to have somebody on there to open and close, and all that sort of stuff. But those are all overcomable barriers that have been put up, but sometimes schools just can't, can't operate in that mode because, because the computer lab is right in the middle of the school, so you'd have to open up the whole school for, for longer hours and have a lot of costs associated with it. But I think, I think I, the people in the ministry are trying to look at, at that as an option about how could, you, how could you more effectively use the school as a community hub rather than just as an education hub. Maybe you have dual function. And because you're you're doing something like that at the moment, aren't you? And in fact, <laughs> indeed. Oh, so over to you. Um, well, I mean, locally, there's a couple of initiatives, and um, and certainly throughout the Computer Hubs Trust um, has a plan of uh, providing that central point that people can go, self-paced learning, um, literally utilising some of the 2020 Communications Trust assets. Um, that, that's the digital assets that they've been developing, and um, our vision really is to provide that help and support for anyone in the community. So grandma can come in and say, well, you know, I've got some photos on here that I'd like to, to get printed somehow. How do I do that? Um, right through to someone who says, well, you know, I'd like to upskill in my job because now I have to use a Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, you know. And I, I, I don't, I've never seen them even before. What do I do? And so those drop-in centres will be up, up the coast. Uh, we talked with Nadi Perot as well. Um, they're going to make that available in the the uh, first one will be in Ruatoria. That's already resourced, it's already there. Um, basically, we just need to um, fund someone to um, look after it. Obviously, as a drop-in centre, we need to just be cautious of security and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but that's under underway and will be um, released in due course. So there's a couple of initiatives locally, so that's really good. Other questions, comments, thoughts? So how could our organisation access your Okay. Well, would you, would you 
Yeah. Yeah. So there's 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 three three aspects to digital literacy programs. The first of which is the training material. The second of which is the delivery, and the third of which is what happens at the end of the course. What sort of qualification or certificate do you get? Um, there are people who think that you can do these basic levels of education on a computer, um, and um, we don't believe that. We, <laughs> we, we think if you're trying to teach people how to use a computer, telling them there's an online course isn't going to help. <laughs> um, so we, we've basically got some material which we are we, we're willing to make available to other people. Um, I don't think that it's got any copyright, but if it, if it does, then we'll switch it to Creative Commons, but I don't even think we've gone as far as that. So we've, we make our training material freely available. Typically, um, you would have to do the delivery, so you'd have to find some, some trainers to do that. And then the third is the certificate, which you can produce yourself, saying certificate produced by us. Or the, the first level where we get an externally validated um, certificate is the Kiwi Skills one. The others are just, this person has passed these courses or a record of attendance. But we've used that, the, the model of sharing our delivery material with a number of libraries in, um, in Wellington now. So they're running... Um, they bring in a trainer and they pay for the trainer and we provide the course material and they, they provide it as a, a training facility. So yeah, I'll give you my contact details afterwards and you can do that. Yeah. I think there's a couple of ways locally that that can be, be delivered and, um, and it's just great to catch up with Lawrence again. Yeah. Um, this is his second um, go at the Tech Expo. Yep. So he was here in support of the first one. So um, it's really great to see him along and yeah, we'll be, be working together in the, in the future most definitely. And we're going to, uh, Russell was talking about the hubs, so we're funding the computers and the equipment in two of those hubs, I think, at the moment. Yeah. Well, we're going we're to sign the document this afternoon <laughs> that we've done that. Right. But, um, yeah, so uh, it, it allows us to, to deal with the problem that was, it's all very well, but what do you do about access afterwards? And so we see the building of community access points as being an important component of that. It's like, I mean, I always think of the analogy as being like the internet is the roads, and... Um, most people can afford a car, but for those that can't, there's public transport. And I think the community hubs is effectively the public transport on the, 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 um, in the information wage. Um, you have to go there. It doesn't come straight to your door, similarly with the, the computer community hubs. But it's the same thing that it gives, you, it gives you access to being able to travel on the roads in a way that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. Great, yeah, great analogy. Um, Lawrence will be around for the rest of today, yep. so um, feel free to make yourself available to him, ask him questions. I think one of the greatest things, components, if you like, about the Tech Expo is just to get people together from different elements of, of our community, but also to have the experts come into this community and allow us to talk to them and, and, and they can, can hear what we're saying as well. So make yourself available to these guys, ask their opinions, yep. um, see what's happening in, in the other parts of the world. And, what we can, can grab and, and make use of here. So thank yeah. you for listening. Thanks very much. Um, and we'll take up for a little while, so stand up and do the whole people thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.